Hi there, I'm the Myth Keeper. Welcome back to my channel, the best place on the internet for Pathfinder lore and history. This week, I'm doing something completely different. No creature feature, no demigod series, no region deep dive. I'm going to talk about ships of the inner sea. So uh, this is kind of a, a general uncategorized type of video that I wanted to do in advance of my shackles video. I'm going to talk about the different kinds of ships that you might encounter out in the inner sea, but also I'm going to talk about the major maritime shipping routes as well. So we're going to take a look at how uh, goods and services move all across the world of Galarian. I think this is actually a really fun video. Enjoy. Next week, I'll be doing a regional deep dive on the islands of the shackles, a territory controlled by pirates. In that video, I'll be making the use of various nautical terms and types of ships, so I thought that instead of covering some of that material in that video, I'd do another more general video on the ships of the inner sea. In this video, I'll cover some of the more important nautical terms, and I'll cover the various types of ships common to the inner sea region. Finally, I'll culminate with a look at the common trade routes of the inner sea, as well as take a moment to look at the flags and sails of the important maritime nations. A glossary of nautical terms and an index of the common types of vessels in the inner sea. There's much to cover here, so let's start by looking at directions given aboard a sailing ship. Looking at a sideways cross-section of a ship, we can segment the ship into various vertical and horizontal locations where sailors may be positioned. In the upper rigging, a sailor is said to be aloft, while in the lower rigging, a sailor is said to be alow. A sailor walking any part of the main decks, including any raised fore and aft decks, is said to be on deck. Sailors below the main decks are referred to as being below decks, never downstairs. Segmented horizontally, the front of the ship is referred to as the fore, while the rear of the ship is said to be the aft. The foremost and aftmost extensions of the deck are referred to as the bow and the stern, respectively. Finally, switching to an overhead view, the left side of the ship is always referred to as the port side, because traditionally sailing ship always berth on the left, and most will only have extensions or gangplanks on this side to ease the passage to port side docks. The right side of the ship is conversely referred to as the starboard side. On a three-masted sailing ship, the important part of the ships are as follows. The aftmost mast is referred to as the mizzen mast. The center mast is referred to as the main mast, and it likely has the highest top or lookout point, commonly referred to as the crow's nest. The foremost mast is conveniently referred to as the foremast. At the aftmost point of the ship there will typically be a rudder, and the front of the ship will have a wooden spar that extends from the bow to support forward sails called the bowsprit. The bowsprit is commonly decorated with a figurehead of some kind. Many three-masted ships have their top deck separated on three levels, often one in the aft that sits over a captain's cabin or stern castle, and one in the fore that sits on top of the forecastle or forecastle. The rearmost deck is often called the quarter deck if it is long, or the poop deck if it is narrow. The other two decks are more obviously named the main deck and the fore deck, respectively. The main deck is sometimes called the waist deck, or working deck, and collectively all exposed decks are sometimes also referred to as the weather decks, as they are exposed to the elements. Some ships possess multiple levels between the main deck and the hold, and these may be referred to as the tween decks, which is a short form of the between decks. Other ships with fewer levels may simply refer to this as the lower deck, or by the deck's function, such as the crew quarters or the galley, a nautical term for a ship's kitchen. The lowest deck that sees functional use is typically the hold, which is used for cargo storage, but most large sailing ships contain a level below the hold, referred to as the bilge. The bilge often contains a pump to release waters in case of water seepage that might occur due to imperfections in the seal or other spillage. Other important nautical terms include the helm, which is the wheel or tiller by which the ship is steered, the hull, which refers to the outer body of the ship, the keel, which is the bottom of the hull, and the ratlines, which are the ropes or lines that serve as steps for going aloft. Now, let's look at some common ship types, arranged roughly from smallest to largest. I chose to try to sort this list by size, because I figured RPG players would like to get a sense of the boats from least threatening to most threatening, rather than using the conventional alphabetical sort. That being said, do be aware that sizing for ships is inexact, as there are no standards among shipbuilders. Size is also not generally the major differentiating feature between ships. Rather, construction and design are. So, for example, I've listed a longship as being smaller than a felucca, but it's not uncommon for bigger longships to be constructed and smaller felucas to be constructed as well, so individual examples might contradict the sizing as I've laid them out for you. 
Dinghy. The smallest sailboat is called a dinghy and is usually between 8 to 15 feet in length, with some being slightly larger. These sailboats vary in how they are used, but typically they can either be sailed with the use of a removable mast or moved with oars. Dinghies are ubiquitous sites across all port towns used by fishermen and couriers alike. They are not large enough to risk open water journeys across large stretches of ocean, however, so they tend to be kept close to port or even loaded into larger vessels as a spare vessel or launch. Longship. With their narrow open hulls, single square sails, and large number of oars that provide most of the propulsion, longships are commonly used by Ulfen for transporting cargo and raiding. Longships are particularly adept at both sea travel and river travel. They are not just common in the steaming sea. Longships were brought by the Ulfen people to Iobaria, and so they are surprisingly common in the river kingdoms, especially in the northeastern reaches. Feluca. Feluca are fast, sleek vessels employed for fishing and transporting cargo, and rarely as raiding vessels. Felucas have a shallow draft and can navigate rivers easily, employing both sails and oars. Because of their utility as riverboats, Felucas are often seen sailing up and down the Sphinx in Osirian and in other major rivers throughout the Inner Sea. A sloop. A sloop is a sailboat with a single mast, typically having only one headsail in front of the mast and one mainsail aft of the mast. Sloops are typically constructed for maneuverability, and because they are single-sailed, are typically of smaller construction. They are used by more affluent fisherfolk, wealthy private citizens, and couriers. Some sloops, commonly dubbed sloop o wars are substantially larger, but still maintain the single-masted design. The smaller sloops are capable of river travel, but typically only large major rivers and not smaller tributaries. Catamaran. A catamaran is a small vessel formed of two hulls or floats held side by side by a frame above them. Very fast, but not rugged enough for warfare, they are most often used in tropical climes for fishing and transporting cargo. Some island tribes, however, sometimes use catamarans to carry their warriors into battle, board unwary ships at anchor or raid. Despite being smaller vessels because of their wider design, they are not always suitable for river travel. Caravel. A caravel is not unlike a sloop, except that it replaces its single square-sailed mast for a pair of masts that use lateen sails. Lateen sails are triangular sails set on a sloping yard. Caravels are also characterized by a high stern castle and are generally employed in cargo or fishing, but sometimes armed for raiding. Junk. Having square sails set on masts that are often stepped off the center line of the ship, a high stern and a flat bottom, junks are slow, sturdy craft, employed as cargo vessels and warships by many Tian nations. Galley. A galley is basically a very large longship, propelled mainly by one to three tiers of oars, but also sporting latine sails. Galleys are great for boarding maneuvers and are occasionally employed as short-range warships, in these cases, they are heavily armed with ballistas and heavy rams at the end of the bow. Like longships and other oared vessels, they have a shallow draft and are the largest class of ship that can safely navigate rivers. Galleys do not handle high seas well due to their low profile and can founder in rougher conditions. Some galleys are optimized for serving as harbor protection or in blockades, war galleys, so to speak, and these may support large numbers of soldiers, archers, and siege engines. Such vessels are also often called cat of wars Brigantines. The brigantine is a two-masted vessel, like a caravel. However, it swaps the latin sail on its foremast with a square mainsail. Brigantines are typically smaller than schooners and brigs, which also have two masts but with square sails, but they are slightly more maneuverable. Brigantines are often employed as armed merchants, escorts, privateers, or corsairs. As mentioned earlier, there are no real rules about how big or small a vessel's construction can be, so it's possible to build a very large brigantine with a square mainsail and a latin aft sail, but such a brigantine is often called a barkantine to reflect its greater size. Schooner. The schooner is the smallest of the proper two-masted vessels, a sort of linear upgrade from the sloop in some ways. Characterized by a long keel and fore and aft rigged sails, schooners are fast and can sail very close to the wind. They are used for fishing and as fast merchant vessels, but are rarely armed, relying on superb maneuverability to evade trouble. Brig. These two-masted, square-rigged ships are employed as fast merchant vessels, but are also often armed as corsairs and privateers. The difference between a brig and a schooner is largely academic, as they are both two-masted ships with square sails, but generally schooners are optimized for speed, while brigs are optimized for versatility. 
They're not quite considered a combat-class vessel, but despite being lighter and easier to build than frigates, they are still able to carry a comparable armament. Therefore, brigs are common craft for pirates, and brigs flying black flags and sails are the scourge of the inner sea region. Galleon. Finally, we get to our three-masted ships, the smallest design of which is typically the merchant galleon. They are square-rigged in the foremast and mainmast, and lateen-rigged on the mizzen. An eminently durable design, characterized by the lofty forecastles and sterncastle, galleons see frequent use as heavily armed merchant ships. Frigate. Three-masted and square-rigged, frigates are the smallest of the rated ships, those commanded by an officer of captain rank or higher. They are typically fast and heavily armed, with one or two deck ballistae and bow-mounted catapults. Frigates can hoist a huge number of sails, require large crews, and are often manned with specially trained fighting marines for boarding actions. Battleship. These vessels are used as main forces by large navies. Battleships commanded by commodores often head squadrons, hunt pirates, or escort merchant fleets or expeditions. With upwards of 40 ballistae, 3 to 4 catapults, and often 200 fighting sailors, such a ship is rarely tangled with by a lone corsair. Man o' War. These sailing behemoths are the height of military naval engineering. Generally fleet flagships commanded by admirals, men of war rarely leave port with fewer than a dozen other warships accompanying them. With up to 50 ballistae, three or four decks, half a dozen heavy catapults, and hundreds of fighting sailors, marines, clerics, and wizards, these intimidating ships are virtually unstoppable. Let's now take a look at the largest maritime trade routes of the inner sea. I'll try to move through these geographically, starting in the northwest and moving eastwards and southwards, discussing both the major trade routes and the significant maritime nations connected to them as I go. The Steaming Route The first major trade route is the Steaming Route. The Steaming Route connects the Linorm kingdoms, as well as the port cities of New Thessalon with Varicia and their prominent trade routes known as the Varician Reach. One leg of the Steaming Route travels westwards over the short northern stretch of the Arcadian Ocean to reach Valinhall, the Ulfin's sole settlement in the remote western continent known as Arcadia. Four of the seven major Linorm kingdoms, specifically Broken Bay, the Thanelands, Southmoor, and the Ironbound Islands, could be considered major maritime powers in their own right. In ages past, Ulfin raiders plied the steaming route and other southern routes to raid the rich southern lands in their longships. The longships were ideally designed for both sea travel and for use along rivers. They were even light enough to be lifted overhead by a raiding company and moved to other adjacent rivers for surprise attacks or to further their reach. Today, only the reavers of Broken Bay continue the tradition of raiding and pillaging, and their ships have been found in New Thessalon, in Varicia, and even as far south as Ravenel and Cheliax. Broken Bay raiders not only pillage coastal towns and villages, but also take ships at sea. For those smaller vessels that try to put up a defense, few survive the fury of these pirates. But Ulfin raiders can often be bartered with, if merchants indicate a desire to parley. Although longboats are still in use and quite popular in these kingdoms, increasingly the Linorm kingdoms have also begun to develop fleets of more modern vessels. As maritime nations, it's important they keep up to date with modern nautical innovations. Additionally, the emergence of New Thessalon in the midst of their southern territories has prompted many of the Linorm kingdoms to focus on military naval development efforts, as many conflicts have already occurred between Bellamarius and the Linorm kingdoms. Linorm kingdom ships sailing south, formerly representing the nations, will typically fly the flag of the kingdoms united, a golden Linorm set upon a red field. However, each of these countries also possesses its own version of the flag a golden linorm on an indigo field for Broken Bay, on a teal field for the Thanelands, on a white field for the Ironbound Islands, and on an amber field for Southmoor. The Black Ravens, the devoted protectors of the Linorm Kingdom's border territory of Hagreach, may sometimes, though much more rarely, sail south as well, and if they do, their flag is the golden linorm upon a black field. There are plenty of ships sailing out of the Linorm Kingdoms that have no official national allegiance as well. Such ships may fly independent merchant company colors, or clan or family colors as well. In addition to the Linorm Kingdoms, the Rune Lords of New Thessalon have been growing their own fleet as well. From her capital city at Zin Adasaril, the Rune Lord Bellamarius's vessels can be identified by the golden Rune of Envy set against a purple field. They will often accompany the symbol with the general flag of New Thessalon, shared by her and sister Rune Lord Sorshin. Conversely, Sorshin's fleet, headquartered in the city of Brinewall at the mouth of the Steam River, generally fly sails of cobalt blue and simply fly the banner of New Thessalon, preferring not to showcase the symbol of lust, her own chosen sin power. 
Despite this, independent ship captains who are loyal to Sorshin and her new nation may still fly the lust symbol in accompaniment of the new Thassalon symbol. Finally, we should touch on Irisen. The Iriseni lands were once a part of the greater Linorm kingdoms, but were conquered by witches in 3313, as described in both my Irisen and Linorm kingdoms deep dive videos. The Iriseni capital of White Throne was a major Ulfen city once, and as such, had a significant port and shipbuilding infrastructure for the manufacture of vessels that would sail down the Rhymeflow River and out to sea. For much of the last millennia and a half since the witch conquest of Irisen, they and the Linorm kingdoms have been at war, and Iriseni ships have not been welcome, or even permitted access to the upper reaches of the Rhymeflow. However, some of that may be changing. Since 4723, a new queen has come to power in Irisen, the much more diplomatically minded Queen Anastasia. Since that time, a small number of Iriseni vessels have been permitted each month to sail the Rhymeflow and set out to sea to build relationships with foreign countries abroad. Irisen has an interesting mix of relationships, as the witches often favor alliances with other cultures open to acquiring power through agreements and patronages made with sinister extraplanar forces such as the Shadow Lords of Nadal, the Lords of Infernal Cheliax, and more recently, the Rune Lord Bellamarius. They have also developed more friendly relations with the Orcs of Belksen, and with Pola the Bureaucrat, Lord Governor of the independent city-state of Eistair. Indeed, Pola has started to construct ten-style junks on the frigid banks of the Little Tusk to extend his own trade network, and a few Eistair vessels are now trading openly with Chen allies found in the Jade Quarter of Kalsgard and even beyond. Iriseni vessels fly white sails, and a flag that features a rendering of Baba Yaga's famous walking hut. Ice stairs vessels can be identified by their distinctive tan style, and also the jade green color of the flag they fly, featuring a stylized version of the city-state's vast stairway up to the crown of the world. The Verician Reach The second major trade route is the Verician Reach. These trade routes connect New Thassalon and the Linorm kingdoms to the north, with Ravenel, Nidal, and Cheliax in the south. The reach typically ends at the Arch of Aradon. The ancient, ruined, megalithic bridge known as the Arch of Aradon spans the Hesperoth Strait between the Inner Sea and the Arcadian Ocean. Until recently, it was constantly patrolled by a Chelish armada from Corinton, who attempted to levy heavy taxes to any making use of the waterways. However, at the end of the Hell's Vengeance adventure path, one of the lasting consequences of Cheliax's civil struggle in the city of West Crown is that in diverting resources to pacifying the city, they lost their hold on the southern side of the strait, which has been reclaimed by Rahadum in the last five years. As a result, Chelish vessels are no longer welcome on the far side, and this has effectively opened up the strait and greatly increased traffic through it. Turning our attention back to the Reach, there are generally considered to be three main dangers of sailing the Verician Reach. The first is the deadly Northwester Storms that come surging through the southern reaches of the Ironbound Archipelago. Captains in this area have learned to predict the coming of these frigid winds that hail from the steaming sea, and must time their ventures accordingly to avoid them. The second challenge in sailing this region is the abundance of Riddleport Pirates. The city-state of Riddleport was in fact founded by pirates and corsairs who would rove out to Conqueror's Bay to intercept ships sailing from mainland Cheliax to its remote northern province of Corvosa. Since Corvosan independence and the emergence of Magnamar as a regional power hub, Riddleport has become a somewhat less criminal city, or at least it displays the veneer of law to outsiders, but in truth the city-state's ruler, overlord Gaston Cromarchy, happily turns a blind eye to the numerous corsairs operating out of his harbour, because they have the effect of in turn enriching the city of ciphers. The third and final treacherous region is Hellmouth Gulf, a large bay on Cheliax's western coast. The islands of Thurian and Bogrock lie off Hellmouth Gulf, and the village of Blackcove is the only settlement of note. Dark sand and sharp rocks cover most of the bay's beaches, and the waters often carry a sulfurous smell. Numerous pirate hideouts are scattered across the Black Islands. Furthermore, the waters of the Gulf are also home to a greatly feared sea serpent whose name is never spoken for fear that doing so might invoke the creature's wrath. The most commonly found ships in the region belong to the local maritime nations. Ships sailing a beige flag with a rendering of the cipher gate identify themselves as being from Riddleport. Many in Riddleport do not fly their own colors, however, and no pirate vessels originating in that city will ever fly the city's colors and flag. Ships from Magnamar can be identified by a sky-blue flag sporting an angel in white and the Irespan Bridge. Sailing down from the wide Yonder Bakari and the mighty Sarantula Lake come the few Kermagan vessels. 
these ships sail a dark navy flag with a symbol showcasing the twisted door, an ancient edifice built at the base of the Storval Plateau by extraplanar entities in the Age of Serpents. Corvosan ships fly a black and crimson flag, a remnant of their long-standing connection to Imperial Cheliax, which still shares these colors to this day. Today, many Corvosan ships will fly the black and crimson Corvosan flag, but complemented by sails of white and crimson, to more easily differentiate themselves from Chelish vessels. Nidalese ships also ply the Verician Reach. Nidal's flag is blood-red, with a shackled skull and bone white upon it. Nidalese sails are often a plain, monochromatic blood-red. However, Nidalese ships also often practice the art of flag and sail swapping, especially when sailing near nations in the inner sea not friendly with Nidal. Further south still, the new nation of Ravenel's flag is a mixture of slate blue and white, with a crest and silver raven upon it. Ships bound from the capital city of Cantargo, also known as the Silver City, will often fly silver streamers as well. Ships bound from Ravenel's other large city of Vire may also occasionally fly the Ravenelian flag, but the secretive city of Masks will often choose to hide their identity, or identify themselves as belonging to a particular guild or faction instead. The Encarthan Circuit Shipping cargo between Tamron, Corholm, Curse, Greengold, Thronestep, and Caliphas, a fleet of nimble caravels plies this lucrative but dangerous route, sailing as far as possible from the treacherous shores of the Isle of Terror and the Gravelands. By way of the Goldpan River, the great dwarven city of Highhelm and its few remaining ships are also connected to the Incarthan Circuit. The western and southern Salen River also connect the Incarthan Circuit to Taldor and the greater inner sea at the port of Casimir. Through this river, all the free nations along the Incarthan Circuit have access to greater maritime trade with nations located far from central Avistan. Additionally, through the westernmost branch of the Selen, the most remote parts of Ustalav are also connected to this network, including the intellectual city of Lepidstadt and the artistic city of Karkau. The Sarkorian city of Gundrun is also connected to the Incarthan Circuit via the West Selen as well. Significant nations with major ports along the Incarthan Circuit include Nirmathus, whose ships sport a green and yellow flag embellished with a white tree, Malthun, whose flag is a field of bright chelish red embellished with a white hammer and sword, Druma, whose flag is red and white decorated with a circle of emeralds surrounded by a prominent ruby, Highhelm, the dwarven capital, whose ships fly a flag of stone grey embellished with a pick, hammer, and shield of luminous gold, Kionin, the elven nation whose flag showcases the emerald green Severian stone on a white canvas, Resmiran, the tyrannical coastal nation ruled over by a self-proclaimed god, whose flag is yellow and purple, embellished with a white mask, and finally Ustalav, whose recognizable flag features a black tower and antlers set against a dark purple field. The cults of the Whispering Tyrant, who control the treacherous territory known as the Gravelands, are not commonly found sailing these waters except as piratical raiders. On the rare circumstances that such ships need to make diplomatic overtures to other nations, they will commonly fly false colors until they reach their destination. When they do identify themselves as members of the Whispering Way cult, they showcase a black flag featuring a bound or gagged skull. The Sarkorian city of Gundrun has few ships, and the Sarkorians are only just now re-establishing themselves after the closure of the world wound. But the Sarkorians were great sailors once, operating along the length of the Sarkora River. They are beginning to re-establish themselves in the region, and those few ships they have constructed do now fly the old Sarkorian flag, a rendering of four significant totemic animals, a bear, a fish, a wolf, and a hawk, set on a white backdrop. The Northeastern Trade Routes Four significant nations border the Lake of Mists and Veils, and all four have significant maritime presence. In addition, the Lake of Mists and Veils is connected to the Incarthan Circle by way of the Selen River, which connects with the Incarthan Circle at Callus Lake. These trade routes also connect with the Incarthan Circle in the west, following the Egglesea River beyond the Mendevian city of Nerosian, where the trade routes meet in Lake Porphyria. Meanwhile, traveling east from the Great Lake, along the Arshrod River, one will eventually reach the Castrovin Sea. Because it is choked with ice for much of the year, not many regularly travel on the Ardshrod, despite the river serving as the only waterway between northern Avistan and the Castrovin. As the name suggests, the Lake of Mists and Veils is shrouded with low clouds and fogs that drift across the lake year-round. Heavy fogs roll in off the coastlands here, and navigating the frigid waters of the Great Northern Lake requires exceptional skill. Although larger vessels can be found plying the waterways of the lake itself, getting such vessels down the Selen is complicated, and so much smaller ships tend to traverse the river kingdoms. 
Merchant captains who wish to make their way in the world by plying these waterways must invest significantly in protection services. The waterways of the River Kingdoms are plagued by pirates and raiders, especially hailing from the Protectorate of the Black Marquis or from the Numerian Bloodgar clan of Kelids. Because this region is so fractured, it's hard to provide a full accounting of the flags, sails, and ships one might encounter in this region. The River Kingdoms represents a fractious collection of independent states, all of whom have their own flags and colors. For more details about this perilous region, see my River Kingdoms deep dive video. In addition to the River Kingdoms, ships may be seen sailing colors of Mendev, whose flag is patterned with blue and red and decorated with Iomidean swords. Numeria, whose flag features a white triangle on a black canvas. Brevoy, whose national flag features a grid of white and yellow, embellished with a red dragon. Few ships in Brevoy fly the national flag, however. Most ships are sworn to one of the great houses. The two most significant from a maritime standpoint are House Sertova, which controls Iceport, and whose house crest includes a grey ship on a field of black and blue, and House Lodovka, whose crest includes a green crab scaling a grey tower. Finally, east of Brevoy is Ayubaria. Ayubaria is presently no longer a united land. The former capital of Orlov is now an independent city-state ruled over by House Coria, whose crest features a griffin set on a green field. Along the Castrovan coast, House Evias of Crydorn deploys ships flying a flag of a lion on an orange field, while House Rukov of Mern Bay flies a magenta flag featuring a crown and flying sword. The North Tack The North Tack is the trade route that moves along the northern edge of the Inner Sea. It runs from the Hesperus Strait and the Arch of Aridin, where it connects with the Verusian and Sand Coast reaches in the west, all the way to Taldor and Absalom, where it connects with the Inner Sea's South Tack in the east. Significant Chelish ports of interest along the North Tack are Corentin, West Crown, and by way of the Adivian River, the capital of Igorian, as well as more easterly ports of Remisiana, Lakestal, and Ostenso. From there, the North Tack also stops at many Andorish ports, including Augustana and Almas, then moves on to the Talden ports of Casimir, where it connects to the Incarthan Circle, and the Talden ports of Riddenport and Opara. Finally, the North Tack connects to the Cortos Isles, including the great city of Absalom and the port of Eskadar. The North Tack is a well-plied trade route, but it isn't always the safest route, which is why increasingly many merchants now favour the South Tack, which follows the northern coast of Garand instead. The reason for this is long-standing friction between Andoran and Cheliax. Around Aspo Bay in particular, the ceasefire between Andoran and Cheliax is frequently interrupted by sporadic naval skirmishes between the two regional powers, and it is not uncommon for merchant vessels to get caught up in the skirmish. Similarly, following the North Tack eastwards, the Saray coast is similarly unsafe. For centuries, the Taldans and the Kadirans have engaged in privateering against each other's vessels, and that conflict is only ever just temporarily on pause. Still, so many important ports are located on this route that it continues to see very heavy traffic. The most common ships and their flags found along this trade route include Cheliax, whose black and crimson flag and sails continue to inspire fear in the hearts of would-be pirates. Andoran, whose black and navy flag features a golden eagle. Taldor, whose noble white lion and blue-green colors have remained unchanged since the nation's founding over 6,000 years ago. And Absalom, the so-called city at the center of the world, whose teal crest continues to feature a stylized version of Aradin's winged eye symbol. The Sand Coast Reach. The Sand Coast Reach connects with the north and south tacks, as well as with the Verusian Reach at the Arch of Aradin. It follows the sandy coast of Rahadum, connecting the recently captured city of Kari to the significant Rahadumi port of Botasani, and in turn to the capital city of Azir. Those in the know are also aware the Sand Coast Reach can be used to connect with Ilis Magorti, the so-called Black Pearl of the Tropics, the sole significant settlement on Medjugalti Island and the largest base of operations of the organization known as the Red Mantis Assassins. During periods when the Eye of Abendego is in recession, the Sand Coast Reach can also be considered to extend along the dangerous interior coastline of the Soddenlands, and can be used to reach the cities of Hirantum, Kokotang, and Jula, though these cities were so devastated during the destruction of Lyrgen and Yamasa that few have caused to visit the Soddenland these days. Besides serving as a vital connection between the Fever Run and the Arch of Aradin, and being navigated by various merchant factions, the Sand Coast Reach is sailed only by two major national powers. The first is the atheist nation of Rahadum, whose national flag is yellow and features outspread hands. The second of which is Mediogalti, but the Red Mantis assassins of Ilis Magorti do not fly any national colors, as theirs is a secretive nation who will almost always fly false colors. The South Tack 
The inner sea south tack is the safest stretch of maritime traffic in the entire region. Few pirates raid these shores, but the arid lands of the Golden Road have fewer large settlements to resupply at along the way. When traveling westwards, captains will tend to make good time along the south tack, but many captains favor the less secure north tack when traveling eastwards because the easterly beat along the south tack puts them directly against the region's prevailing winds. Wily sailors, though, have learned they can use the cape effect and diurnal winds generated from the heating and cooling of Garin's vast northern desert to make the passage easier and more profitable, even when traveling east. The South Tack begins at the Rahadumi port city of Kari, in the north of the country. It features stops in the mighty port city of Manaket, the second largest city in Rahadum, and the city-states of Merab and Aspinthar in Thuvia. By way of the Uta and Janira rivers, the other large Rahadumi city-states of Duwar and Lamasara are also connected to the South Tack. Of the great Thuvian city-states of old, only the desert-bound city of Pashao is disconnected from the sea trade. In its eastern reaches, the South Tack becomes substantially busier as it connects with the significant ports of Osirian, Kadira, and Absalom. Significant ports along this stretch include Totra, the Osirian capital of Sothis, and by way of the Sphinx River its many sister cities, El Shalad, Merev, Hawa, the Kadiran capital of Kathir, and by way of the Pashman River the various other major Kadiran settlements, the northernmost Kadiran settlement of Delena, and then back to Absalom, the city at the center of the world. Many nations have made heavy use of the South Tack, some of whom, like Rahadum and Absalom, I have already covered. Here, Kadiran ships can be identified by their bright green flag featuring crossed sabers. Ships from Pharaonic Osirian fly sails of lapis lazuli blue and golden yellow, with a golden scarab of Assyrian raised high. Thuvia is not a truly allied nation, but represents a coalition of allied city-states who have taken the sacred sun orchid as their collective symbol. Each of the cities have their own heraldic colors as well. If a Thuvian ship is ever sailing under the auspices of the nation, rather than one of the major city-states, it may simply fly the pink color of the sun orchid instead. The Fever Run Named for the Fever Sea, the treacherous waters that surround the islands of the Shackles, the trade route known as the Fever Run is actually generally considered to encompass all the sea routes of western Garand. It begins at either Medjugalti Island or the city of Jula at its northern end, where it connects with the Sand Coast Reach. The northern part of the trade route connects to Clareng, the significant Mbeke dwarf port city that sits where the sodden lands meet the shackles. It then either circumnavigates the treacherous pirate islands, or for the free captains themselves, it forms a myriad of passageways through and around the shackles, connecting most of the major settlements of the area. Beyond the shackles, the fever run connects Blood Cove, Sengor, Silvertree, Anthusis, and Port Freedom. By way of the Vanji River, the ancient Mwangi city-state of Nantambu is also indirectly connected to the Fever Run trade route. Further south still, the Fever Run connects with various maritime trading routes of southern Garand. Additionally, the Sengori use a secret trade route across the ruins of Aslant that lead back to Arcadia, which can be taken, with a knowledgeable Sengori guide, by sailing directly west from Sengor. Of all the trade routes in the Inner Sea, no region features a greater hotbed of political intrigue than the Fever Run. First and foremost, it is the home of the free captains of the Shackles, as well as the home of the very many individual rogue pirate captains who don't have fealty to the free captains' council. Secondly, naval skirmishes have dominated the region for centuries now. The Corsair Wars currently going on are hot and heavy between the Mbeke Dwarves and the free captains of the Shackles. After the Vidric Revolution, the free captains also waged war on the newly independent nation of Vidrian because the Vidrics refused to maintain the extortionist scheme the previous colonial government had held with the free captains. This resulted in a alliance between Sengor and Vidrian that still exists to this day. It was not so long ago the port of Blood Cove was blockaded by a fleet of ships from the Pathfinder Society, who were intent on preventing the Aspis Consortium from desecrating the Temple of Kadodi there. And a mere ten years ago, the nation of Chaliak sent an entire armada to the Shackles to attempt to pacify the region, but they were defeated by the free captains. It is chaos out there, that's true, but with so many burgeoning power centers, intrepid merchants are always willing to risk the dangerous waters to make a quick gold piece. A perfect place for maritime adventures. In terms of the ships that can be found here, unaligned pirates can be found in abundance. Other pirates, or perhaps more accurately, privateers loyal to the free captains, can occasionally be found flying the general black flag of the shackles. More commonly, however, even they will have both the black flag of the shackles and a personal crest or flag of their own to build out their own reputation in the area. The Mbeke dwarf ships sail a flag of cerulean blue featuring clouds and a stylized cloud dragon upon it. Vessels from Blood Cove may either fly Aspis Consortium colors or Blood Cove's national colors, depending on their particular factional allegiance. 
Blood Cove's flag features a black skull and moon-shaped boat on a crimson background. Black and red are common colors in the region, being shared by both Imperial Cheliax and the city-state of Sengor. To avoid confusion, Blood Cove tends to fly sails of red and black, inverted to the layout favored by Chelish ships. Vessels from Nantambu fly a flag of cobalt blue with gold trim and a golden leopard. Nantambu does not have a significant shipyard or facilities for the construction of ships, so most Nantambu ships are purchased from other nations in the inner sea region and then altered by Nantambu shipwrights. Vessels from Sengor feature a red ship and a flipped sword logo laid on a black field. The sails on Sengori vessels are typically monochromatic red, but they favor complex designs in darker crimson on the sails. The unique Sengori ship designs, originating in distant Arcadia, also set them apart from other vessels in the region. Vidrian's flag features a phoenix rising on a light blue canvas. They have yet to develop shipyards of their own, so like the vessels of Nantambu, most Vidric ships are reclaimed vessels that once belonged to other regional powers. Various other ships belonging to other southern nations may occasionally be found in the Fever Run as well, but little is known about these regions that are not reflected in the Inner Sea world map. These include, in rough geographic sequence from north to south along western Garand, as best we know, Kazulu, a triad of Bekyar city-states just to the south of Vidrian, Ekeshikar, an Iruxi island nation-state to the southwest of Vidrian, Muraseth, the ancestral city-state of the Amarun catfolk, plus the other surrounding Amarun city-states, Froizeth, Esorowan, and Ulumseleth. Nirvacha, home nation of the Anadi, with its capital city of Domithari and significant port city of Majabi. And finally, rumored to be located on the southern tip of Garand, is the secretive nation of Elona, an advanced technomagical society. The Obari Trade Circle. The last major trade route in the inner sea region is called the Obari Trade Circle, and it forms a rough circle around Jalmare Island. At the port of Heger in Kadira, it connects with the southern Kazmarin routes, used by Vudra, Iblidos, and the Padishah Empire. Heger itself is a part of the main loop of the Obari trade circle, which runs from Heger to some significant port cities on Jalmare Island, starting with the port of Padiskar, then Pradahanam, and then around to Niswan. Niswan connects with Ephrysia, the dragon-ruled lighthouse south of Valkis Isle, and in turn with the great Nexian port city of Quantium, which in turn is connected by river to other Nexian cities. An unofficial branch of the Obari trade circle also connects the Ephrysia Niswan leg of the circle to the Gebite capital of Mekitar, as well as further south to the southeastern Garundi trade lanes. Meanwhile, from Quantium, the circle continues along the eastern coast of Garand, with significant port stoppings at Tivens Reed, Katapesh, Okeno, Analak, and El Shalad. From El Shalad, it connects to the inner sea's southern tack, and it rounds the strait on the southern side to continue to Merev. Finally, there are numerous Kadiran ports from Erev to round out the eastern portion of the trade circle, and closing the loop to Heger once again. Some of these include Kundurai, Ayesh, Jawafik, and Kaharid, to name a few. Despite being a heavily trafficked area and a vital maritime crossing point where east meets west, the Obari trade circle is not particularly safe. The areas off the coast of Geb, for example, is only traversed very carefully. The laws protecting the living in the nation of the undead take effect only upon that nation's soil, so sailing these waters without proper protections is not only dangerous, but foolhardy. Though Geb trades heavily in grain harvested by legions of zombies, few free traders without a Gebite escort venture here, for ghost ships patrol Geb's waters, and the night skies are often filled with wraiths, vampires, and worse. The harbour city of Okeno, located on the southern coast of Stonespine Island, off the eastern shore of Katapesh, is the third largest city in Katapesh, and is also one of the inner sea region's largest haven for pirates, larger by both size and number of active pirate captains than the Varician city of Riddleport is. Katapesh's ships are recognisable with their yellow flags, sporting a thorned green cactus for a symbol. Most Katapeshi vessels are not piratical in nature, but enough Katapeshi corsairs from Okeno ply these waters that for many the sight of Katapeshi sails is synonymous with piracy. Nexian vessels fly their national colors and flag, striped black and yellow embellished with red and white circles. Nexian vessels are also recognizable for their large staff of wind and water mages, which makes these well-constructed vessels faster than most other nations' comparatively sized crafts. Jalmaray's fleet carries a banner with their national symbol, a golden lamp billowing smoke around a steel-blue orb. Their sails are also often flown of the same steel-blue color. Geb's vessels fly a smoky purple banner with a Gebite symbol, a silver ankh that is slit down the middle. Many Gebite vessels are ghost ships, or constructed of bone. Most give these sepulchral constructions a wide berth. 
In addition to ships belonging to these four nations, the Obari trade circle also includes many ships from regions beyond the inner sea. Looking eastwards, this includes ships hailing from the Kasman archipelago known as Iblidos, from the Kelishite Empire, from distant Vudra, and finally from the Tian nations even beyond that. Looking southwards, this includes ships from Holomog and Drun, two large nations that lie on the southeastern coastlines of Garand, further south of Geb. It also includes a Garundi nation named Derikhani, renowned as a place of Azata and imperial lord worship, as well as Choksan and Tirakawan, a Vidrani and Kelishite colony respectively, located further south still. Finally, vessels from the southernmost nation-state of Elona might occasionally be making it this far north, and these southeastern trade lanes thereafter round the Cape of Garand and connect with the southwestern Garundi trade lanes and ultimately back up to meet the fever run. Mm-hmm.